In this HVACR training video, we're going over the EEV, the electric expansion valves operation, the wiring, and the testing. So an EEV is typically found on inverter systems and other high efficiency HVAC units. And make sure to check out our new book on inverter mini splits. And we go over the electrical operation of all the components inside. We go over the refrigerant related practices and a lot of the questions that you may have concerning these systems. So check this out in the full outline over at acservicetech.com in the mini split tab. An EEV is an electric expansion valve that has a adjustable pin on the inside of the EEV to regulate the refrigerant flow going through it. So if you have high pressure, high temperature, liquid refrigerant heading through, on this side you'll have low pressure, low temperature liquid over here. And likewise, if you are in heating mode or in air conditioning mode, basically you change the direction of the refrigerant, you'll have high pressure, high temperature liquid coming here, and then you'll have low pressure, low temperature liquid coming over here. And so it's a pressure reduction device and it's electrically driven with 12 volt pulses. So 12 volt DC uh, pulses of electricity and you're gonna see in the inside of here there's little teeth. And there's actually in this one there's 40 teeth total and I cut the, the end cap off the top. It typically looks like this where you have a end cap that's sealed and I, I cut the end cap off so that we could see as well. You'll, you don't have access to the magnet right here. It's always in a sealed stainless steel shell. And so I cut this off so that you could see it and we could also mark it. But basically this is a permanent magnet with 10 north poles and 10 south poles and they're offset from each other. So I just want to show you this right here. We can remove this completely because we cut the stainless steel shell out. And so you can see there's our pin. And so it rides up and down. You have our stainless steel shell separating our permanent magnet with, in this case, it's gonna have 10 north poles and 10 south poles. So you'll have a north, then a south, then a north, then a south, then a north, then a south, all the way around this, even though it looks like just one, one magnet section. So we can take this magnet right here and you can see we have just slight control over it. And what I wanna show you is, so I just wanna count here. So we're gonna start right here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And that would make 11. So you have 10 north and then you have 10 south. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. So we have ten north and ten south, and so you can see we have slate control over it right here, but not a whole lot. So if you try to add a regular magnet on here, you have no control. But if you concentrate that onto the teeth, then you have, say, in this case, ten north teeth. And so you have 10 spots and where you're gonna be grabbing at in order to, to turn this. And so these little teeth are gonna line up with the permanent magnets right here on the inside. A question I get asked a lot is can a solenoid tester that has these two little magnets inside, can that be used to turn the inner permanent magnet of the EEV? And the answer is no, it can't. So as you can see, it's not turning. But if you project that magnetic force onto 10 teeth and you put that around the EEV, then you have enough grip on the inner permanent magnet in order to turn it. But really what you want is you want 20 magnetic forces, so 10 north and 10 south that will really grab a hold of that magnet in order to turn it even when you have the stainless steel shell on the outside. So right now we're applying 12 volt power to one of the two sets of coils inside this uh, section of iron casing. So we have 10 north teeth and 10 south teeth and so we have 20 magnetic forces and so you can see that it's able to grab a hold of that magnet really well in order to be able to turn it. So right now we're riding on the outside of the stainless steel shell and so that's the the upper part right there and so it's still able to turn it, no problem. 
Now you don't want to have this powered by itself for a long period of time. It's just going to be, or even a short period really, it's already heating up so you don't want to burn out the coils. So we're going to turn this power off. So in this head there's 40 iron teeth. So there's four sets of 10. This is what the head looks like when you don't have it covered in plastic like that. And then we go a step further and this is what it looks like when you take it apart. And so what's actually happening here is you do have four sets of 10 iron teeth. So you got one right here and you got one on this side and then you got one here and one here. And so really what's happening is when you power between here and common, we'll say this is north and this is south. And then when you power this one, this is north and this is south. Then when you power this one, this is north and this is south. Then you power that one and that's north and that's south. So basically you have these teeth right here on the inside in a manner where they're all offset from each other. So you have just like this rotating magnetic field that is just going to be turning this permanent magnet with 20, so 10 north and 10 south at a time, magnetic forces. So it's just a rotating magnetic force, essentially what's, what's happening every time that you, you take your 12 volts across each of these. So you have to have, say, negative here, and then you're going to have positive here, and so that's what's happening. So then it's a matter of finding the right sequence. So in this case, we have a six wire EEV. So we have our 12 volt power supply over here. You could just use a 12 volt battery if you were gonna do this in the classroom, but you have a negative polarity on these two wires. And these two are your common wires. And so one common is to the lower sets of coils and the other common is to the upper sets of coils. And so you have two coils in the top, and so you got two wires coming out, and then you got two wires in the bottom, two wires coming out. Now you're not gonna be able to tell which ones are what until you take electrical resistance readings with a multimeter or using the manufacturer's literature. But I'll check the electrical resistance values of each of these when we're done in order to show you what's going on. But the whole point is you are gonna need a certain sequence to apply your 12 volt power in order to get this to move. And so, the EEV works on 12 volt direct current pulses to each one of these wires. And if you want to change the direction, then all you need to do is just change the direction in which the uh, tabs are being powered. And so you can see we're going from the top down here. And when we do that, we're rotating say clockwise. But if we go from the bottom up, it's going to move the inner permanent magnet counterclockwise. And so all we're doing is we're just doing this really quickly when we're going across all of these tabs, so all four. And so if you were to hit these in, say, the wrong sequence, see how we're, we're moving steady right now? But if we went from here to here, you see we're just kind of jogging back and forth. But if you were to go from say like here to there or here to there, you gotta make sure that you have the right sequence. It's very easy how the electrical circuit board is opening the pathway down here very precisely. It's using a set number of pulses. So maybe it's 16 pulses would be one, two, three, four. So four times four, 16 pulses. It just made a refrigerant adjustment down here at the pin. That's how it works. And so anytime a mini split system starts up, you're gonna hear it go click, 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 click. And then after it fully closes, you're gonna hear another set of clicks. And so that is the EEV on a mini split system making that noise. And it's because the circuit board in the mini split is trying to determine what position the pin is at. And so it fully seats it upwards and then fully seats it downwards in order to know where the pin location is. Now let's see how many individual pulses it takes to fully open the EEV. So I just did 80 times four, so you got 160, so you got 320 pulses total in order to fully open that up. Now, sometimes I was accidentally hitting one of the wrong terminals, and so this EEV may end up 
supplying, say, 400 pulses, even if it only needs, say, 280 or something like that. But that's how it works. It's going to supply more pulses in it than it needs, and it's not going to do any damage. As you can see, it's not going to get stuck. It's not going to get stuck at all. And you can just go ahead and start reclosing it back down again. It's important to realize that when this head is powered in sequence with 12 volt pulses across the wires, it's going to be turning this permanent magnet, but after it does that, there's no longer power that's sent to the head. And so this pin is naturally going to just stay in this position. And so it's not going to move again until this EEV head is powered with a certain amount of 12 volt pulses, and it's going to turn this magnet again in order to adjust the pin and then after that it's no longer powered the pin stays right at that location so it's pretty simple now let's go ahead and turn the power off and we're going to take some electric resistance value measurements so we're going to clamp down here on our common wires and then we're going to take our other clamp put it on to the white so the whole point is that a six wire functions very similarly to a five wire and so this one right here is a five wire, as you can see right there, whereas this one is a six wire. So the two commons basically at the indoor PCB, the printed circuit board, these two may connect or they may be separate depending on the circuit board. But as far as testing goes, you could just connect these together in order to check your resistance values or you could do them separately. In this case, we're just gonna do them separately so that you can see what's going on here. So we have from red to white, we have nothing. From red to blue, we do have a electrical resistance value, so we have 45 ohms. So that's red to blue. Red to orange, nothing. And red to yellow, we have very close to 45 ohms, so 44.7. So if we were to go from yellow to blue, we're going to have double the electrical resistance value. And that's because the common wire is basically splitting up the two coils. And so that's why you see 90 there. So now if we're going to check brown, we go from brown to white. You got 45 ohms. Now this one is not going to be touching to our blue because that was on our last set of coils. So you do see our electrical resistance value here, 45.6. And so if you were to go from orange to white, you're gonna have double the electrical resistance value, which is correct. And so in this case, that electrical coil is intact. And so what you could do is if you knew your two common wires, you could just have those connected uh, but a lot of times they're going to be in a connector such as this right here, which you're going to be testing. And so you're not going to have just the, the wire sticking out. So you may need uh, smaller probes. So in this case, we can just check right here on the back. So you know that's not your common. we got to find where we are measuring a lower electrical resistance value such as 45. So right there, so blue. So it looks like blue is our common on this one. I don't know if you can see that. So blue's right there. If we put our one probe on blue and we come right down the line, we're gonna get 45 ohms or, or something close to that, say 46 on each one of these terminals. You want to make sure to not accidentally open up the, the terminals by trying to jam the probe, if it's like a large probe, into an area where it's not supposed to be at. So as you can see right here, 46. And if we were to go from here to here, you're going to measure basically double on every single one of these. And that's because they have a shared common. So that EEV is electrically good, but the problem often is that you have rust forming on the inside of this. So something that looks like this, it's not good. Uh, sometimes you can't even get the head off, or actually a lot of times you can't even get the head off. And the whole point is that you want to have this fully insulated. You want to have this all insulated, including the head, on a system because you don't want any condensate 
forming up in here, which ends up producing this rust. And so this, you got to remember that this whole cavity, this whole cavity is going to have low pressure liquid. And so if there's any humidity in the air, so outside of the EEV, even if this is in the outdoor unit, any humidity is going to get attracted onto here and condense because it's a low temperature liquid area. So it's got to be insulated in order to protect this from rust between here and the iron teeth, which can cause a problem with the magnetic force that you're trying to apply. And so it, it may not function anymore properly because of that. So some of the problems that you may run into is rust at the EEV head. You could have a problem with the threading getting internally stuck due to overpressurization during a nitrogen pressure test. That is a possibility. Um, but normally the body of the EEV is pretty hardy and usually doesn't have any problems. You could have a wire that has rubbed and chafed and basically broken off and now you're not able to send your 12 volt pulses from the circuit board to the EEV head. You could have a problem with the PCB itself. Maybe the PCB is malfunctioning and it's not sending the 12 volt pulses to the head. You could also have a loose connection right here maybe that has just wiggled free or it's just not making good contact. So that's several things to look for when troubleshooting on an EEV. And if you want to learn more about mini split systems and all the electrical components inside, make sure to check out our Inverter Mini Split Operation and Service Procedures book. This is available over at our website at acservicetech.com in the mini split tab. Also make sure to check out some of the mini split install and service videos linked down in the description section below. And hope you enjoyed yourself. We'll see you next time at AC Service Tech Channel.